Buenas tardes, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Elba Garcia, Dallas County Commissioner for District 4, and I want to welcome you to our first Immigrant Heritage Month commemoration. Uh, I want to thank, obviously, our Director of Diversity and Inclusion, Mr. Jason Romain, and all the panelists that are here today for coming and sharing your stories with all of us today. Um, I feel honored to be the first one because I believe that when President uh, Barack Obama you know, uh, name this month as the Immigrant Heritage Month commemoration. He made it with the intention, you know, to sit, reflect, like in everything we commemorate, about what immigrants bring to this country. A country of immigrants that has so many needs, and then again, we have some of the best stories. Everybody has a story, but immigrant stories, most of the time, the story of, uh, education, the challenge of uh, accreditations, and of course, you know, the inclusion that we need to go through to become part of the American dream. And I, I know that many of you have heard me say that as an immigrant, when my priest Charming from Oak Cliff asked me to move into Dallas County, I was the first one that said, heck, I'm gonna have to move to another country. I'm going to have to learn English. I'm going to have to go back to dental school. Just there, it was like, oops, probably, baby, you should come and practice in Mexico. <laughs> and I remember him telling me, but Elba, in Mexico, there's a lot of Mexican attorneys. In Dallas County, there's only two, maybe one. I haven't been able to find her. Dentist that is a Latina and speaks Spanish. Of course, this is 39 years ago, right? But I say, and how big is Dallas, uh, Domingo? Well, we're around 500, 600,000. Uh, how many Latinos are in Dallas County? Well, it's growing, you know, and by the time you come here and go back to dental school, it's probably going to be a lot more. How many, Domingo? Well, we expect around a 25%. Dallas, Texas, here I come. Wherever you are, Oak Cliff, I'll be there. <laughs> and um, well, the rest is history, but nevertheless, you know, one of the things that I think that President Biden is doing tomorrow when he is going to announce that um, a relief effort for, to keep families of immigrants together, uh, we expect him to say that tomorrow, uh, you know, uh, spouses of American citizens will get a path to residency and hopefully to citizenship. And that's what it's all about. We know we need the immigrant work. We know we need the labor force. And here in Dallas County, we see it every day. We speak more than 30 languages, more. In Irving, Texas, we probably, I have heard the superintendent say more than 40 languages. Here in our beautiful Dallas County, we speak more than 10. And we hire and pay interpreters in the Dallas County Jail and different departments in more than 20 languages. So we know that English, Spanish, Arabic, Hindu, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Russian, French, you know, they're just a few of the most spoken. But nevertheless, you know, uh, that's why I feel so proud that it was the commissioner's court uh, with our administrator that gave the opportunity to open in 2020 the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And I think Mr. Romain is the perfect director for that office. Someone that speaks many languages, and not only that, has bring us all together about learning about each other every single time that we have these events. And, and that's how we keep this county relevant and our country relevant, not only our state. When people ask me, why is Dallas County growing in steroids? Why do you think it is? Because we have good quality of life and a multicultural, multilingual, you know, workforce that is well-trained in every single aspect of what the economy in the United States needs today. So uh, I want to thank you for the invitation uh, to all of you. I think that we're going to learn different stories. I always feel so proud of hearing the stories of everyone, but especially when it's about immigrant stories. Um, 
makes me very happy and very proud to be one of the commissioner's court and for you to give me the opportunity to represent them and to lead with you the beautiful county that is Dallas County family. So with that, gracias. I want to thank also my team, Ms. Blanca Torres right here and Ms. Coco Salazar uh, for their support. And of course, to all of you for continuing to make our county a better county every day. Muchísimas gracias a todos por estar aquí. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for those wonderful welcoming remarks. Uh, my name is Jason Romain. Um, I'm the uh, Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer for Dallas County, as the Commissioner mentioned. And um, I, myself, um, I'm an immigrant, too. Um, so I was born and raised in Colombia, uh, South America. And uh, just this month, uh, my grandma, who um, I guess came here, I guess about 20 years now. Uh, she just passed her citizenship uh, exam and was sworn in as a U.S. citizen. So I think that was a, a great way for us to celebrate, uh, you know, our Heritage Month as well uh, as, as a family. Um, I'm excited about the panelists that we have with us today. Um, so from from left to right, I uh, have. Uh, Ms. Jessica Veloz, uh, who is a clinician for the Center for Healing and Empowerment. Uh, Mr. Willis Ma, who's the Assistant uh, District Attorney at uh, Dallas County District Att Attorney's Office. Uh, Ms. Um, Elizabeth Perez, who's a Civil Engineering Designer um, in the Dallas County Public Public Works uh, Department. And uh, Ms. Marjana Omarajic, uh, who is a Senior Director of Refugee Services with Mosaic Family Services and Ms. Adriana Portillo, who's the Language Access Coordinator for the City of Dallas. So thank you all for, for being here, uh, for being you know, willing to, to share your story, telling us uh, you know, a little bit about what it's been like to either uh, migrate here or grow up here as a first generation American. Um, so as uh, Commissioner mentioned, um, there's resolutions, there's, uh, this is like a national celebration, right? Is, um, and in this, this month, uh, President Biden's proclamation, I just wanted to read an excerpt from that. Uh, it says, America is the only country in the world with a heart and soul that draws from old and new. We are a home to people whose ancestors have been here for thousands of years and home to people from every place on earth. Some people came here freely. Some came chained by force. Some came from famine struck or, or to flee persecution and some came to chase dreams that are only possible here in America. We all come from uh, somewhere, but we are all Americans. This month, we honor the contributions and celebrate the remarkable courage of our na nation's immigrants whose hopes and dreams helped found this country and continue to push us forward today. Uh, you know, in the proclamation, it mentions that we're all, we're all American, and we're not all necessarily American, right? There's, there's a, lo a lot of us that are uh, immigrants from other countries. There's uh, a lot of us that are uh, undocumented as well. There's, uh, and, but they're still very much part of our, our community uh, here in Dallas County. Uh, the state of Texas, for instance, is the second has the second highest uh, number of undocumented people in the country, uh, and 80 per, eight percent of our workforce here in Texas is uh, provided by undocumented um, workers. Right? Uh, that's nearly one in ten people that are you know doing doing jobs. So. And um, just here in Dallas County alone, um, there's, there's a program, this uh, DACA, the Deferred Arrival for uh, child, or defer, Deferred Action for Childhood Revivals. Uh, there's uh, 33,000 DACA uh, recipients who uh, spent, every year spent about 140 million uh, in contributions to taxes, local and state taxes. So I just think it's also important to, to uh, remember and recognize those folks that are part of our community as well. Um, and uh, also this week, we're celebrating World Refugee Day. So tomorrow in the Commissioner's Court, uh, there will be one of the resolutions presented is in celebration of that, and that's on June 20th. Um, so uh, I know there's, there's events happening for that. Um, so uh, with that, I wanted to go ahead and uh, start with our, our first question. So uh, Ms. Marjana. Um, can you share your story of immigrating to the United States? Well, I guess first, before you you know start answering the question, if you can 
introduce yourself, you know, tell us a little bit about, about who you are, um, you know, and then the question is, can you share your story of immigrating to the United States and to Dallas County in particular? Uh, what were some of the challenges that you faced during your transition? Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Jason, for this wonderful event. My name is Miriana Meragic. I am the director of refugee services. Um, I came to the United States uh, as a refugee from Croatia, um, and uh, that was 26 years ago. I came with my husband and my nine-month-old son. Uh, before that, I was a refugee in Germany for seven years. And uh, then in Germany, uh, in Germany, we did not have an option to apply for a green card or citizenship. Um, you are a refugee, you just know your status of refugees, and then the war was over in my country. I received a letter from the government that I had three months to leave uh, and return to my country. It was not a good time to return, and um, we asked for both other options. Yeah. Well, two other options said to move to the United States. My husband and I lived in the United States because it was just a little bit closer to our country than Australia. Australia seems like the end of the world. So um, I'm glad we made this choice. <laughs> and the officer, when the officer asked us, um, do we have anyone in the United States? We say no. He asked, is there any um, state or city that would you like to go? Uh, we told him that we would like to go when we will have good job opportunities and when we have a long summers. Here we are. <laughs> he said, I think Dallas will be a good place for you, Dallas, Texas. That's how I ended up here. Uh, the transition from one country to another was not easy at all. Uh, even though I already experienced refugee life in Germany, uh, coming here was very um, different. Uh, I, um, some of the challenges I experienced were, um, first of all, the fear of, un of the unknown. You don't know what you come to. Uh, uh, then, uh, about so, you feel that feeling of you are alone. I didn't know anyone here, just me and my husband and my baby. Uh, then fear of your know, lack of knowledge about the system. You don't know um, about health system, um, workforce system, childcare system. Um, you, your, your social net that I left, uh, everyone I love and know, uh, I like behind. So you come into the country that really you don't know what to expect. Um, and of course you pay price for that because you, I just want to share a little story about um, when I went to go to buy my first car, I saw the sign, me and my husband, we were seeing, we saw um, a sign, zero percent interest, qualified buyers. I was thinking, yeah, well, we don't have that, no. which was a big plus in my country. Uh, we know that when we um, came in, they asked for history which we didn't have and then I um, uh, drove out with a new car and 26% of interest for my first car. <laughs> this is the price you pay when you don't know how everything works and sometimes it's the only way to learn because there is no, I mean, there is no other way if you don't have a credit history to, to pay better, to have better deal. <laughs> we will talk later about more challenges. I just want to give to talk about how they came here. Thank you. Thanks, Marjana. Uh, you wish for long summers, and you definitely yes. got that, that wish and more. I so. uh, actually wanted to share something um, related to, to loans that, that you mentioned. I recently learned about a program that provides 1% interest loans for people that are applying for citizenship or for DACA or for green cards. Um, it's an organization called 1% for America. It's a program that was launched, uh, it was launched in 2022. And um, one of the things, that, the reason why this organization was created is that there is 9 million people that are uh, up, uh, eligible to apply for citizenship, but 91% of them don't apply for citizenship. And a big reason is because of that cost. So, you know, um, that organization provides those, those loans, 1% interest, and kind of like, you know, self-sustains the, the organization. So just thought I would share that. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing your, your story of, of migrating here as well. Um, I know we've, I've 
known you for several years now, and you're working with refugee uh, organizations uh, throughout. So, um, okay, and then uh, Willis, um, can you share your experience growing up as a first generation American? And again, please just, you know, introduce yourself first before your, that first question. Sure, hi. Thanks for having me. I'm Willis Small. I'm an assistant DA over uh, here in Dallas County in the Mental Health Division. And uh, to kind of share briefly about yeah, growing up as a first generation American, uh, I think it's very fortunate because uh, I would consider, I don't know if this is a, in a good way, I think maybe very sheltered from a lot of the difficulties that my parents went through. Parents and grandparents went through. Uh, just for example, you know, because my uh, my grandparents, uh, this is through my grandmother's story and grandmother's story, when they fled China at the time uh, communism was taking over. And so they actually had some land, some property. They were property owners, and so they were kind of the targets of that. So they had to flee very quickly. And so they ended up fleeing to Hong Kong. And uh, my grandma was telling me, holding my mother as a baby crossing the river and the machine guns just shooting the water, you know, and just kind of fleeing those situations. So, it was interesting just as I was having dinners with my grandparents and uh, my parents over the years. My, my mom didn't remember much of it because you know, she fled uh, when she was a baby, but my grandma would tell me they just had the, the fear that they never knew what would happen in the next day or their month's time. And so, you know, my grandfather ended up being somewhat of a hoarder. He would have like every single piece of plastic, you know, from containers. Uh, when you would buy clothes, he would try to keep them. And I would ask him, Grandpa, why are you keeping these things? Well, I don't know if tomorrow something's going to happen to our situation where I'm going to need this. I'm going to have to pack our things to go. And I never had to, to deal with that. And so I'm uh, just very, very fortunate because I think I've just seen more of the, the beautiful side of the country where you just have all these opportunities where, you know, just if I, if I work hard, I study hard, um, and just, you know, with the opportunity of that promise that you know, my life would get better. And so, I didn't really know how difficult it was for them. I just did the stories and, and I knew it was bad. And so maybe that was part of the drive to, to want to work hard to make sure that what they did, their efforts were at least in the I see some head nodding. Anybody want to chime in on, on that question as well? Yeah, kind of going off of what you said that, you know, your parents kind of kept you sheltered and away from from what they went through. I feel like I had a similar situation to, you know, my parents came to the U.S. when they were in their early 20s, and they didn't really share what their story with me until I was an adult, and I just, I'm grateful for them for that. Okay. All right. Um, and I guess, Adriana, along the same lines, uh, what lessons from your parents' immigration journey have you had, have had the most significant impact on you? Yeah, I don't know how I can get this to work, but I'm really loud. I've always been told I'm really loud, so I'm <laughs> That was the note I would get on my uh, report card. Does well in school, but talks a lot, and it's really loud. Uh, so my name is Adriana Portillo, and I work for the City of Dallas Office of Equity and Inclusion, welcoming Communities Immigrant Affairs Division. My specific role is I'm the Language Access Coordinator, the inaugural Language Access Coordinator, in fact. And so I'm working with our departments to push out information and resources in languages other than English. So thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, so my parents' immigration story, I think, is very unique because I have, I feel like, three identities because of them. So my mother um, migrated from Costa Rica, and she was the only one out of her six siblings to go to high school. Um, she actually, from what she told me, she had to beg her dad to send her to school because they were like, you're a, you're a girl and you're like in the middle, so we're trying to like get the older kids to go to school. But she fought and fought and fought and was able to go to high school and then was studying to become a teacher in Costa Rica um, and um, had a house and was really like starting to build her life and then found out that she could come to the U.S. and be an au pair for a year and would pay off the rest of her house. So her being smart was like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go work for a year. They're going to pay for my housing, and then I'm going to come back to Costa Rica. But the story that she shares with me, which I think is kind of silly, is she went to Disney World and was like, wow, the United States is the most magical place on earth. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in Disney.
Disney World. Um, so she decided to, to look into options and to stay here because she really enjoyed the quality of life it gave her. Um, back at home, all of her siblings stayed and you can definitely see the like effects of poverty that, that have affected them. Um, their, her siblings and a lot of my aunts and uncles worked on banana plantations. So really, really like grueling work um, and they don't make very much money. In a month, they make maybe $200. So it, it really was beneficial for my mother to come here because now she is supporting my grandmother. So my grandmother is able to live and buy her medications because my mother is able to send money back and forth. Um, and then my father, he's from El Salvador, and um, he came in the 80s because there was a really bad civil war, and he was a student, and he was in seminary school. And those were like two identities that in Salvador you didn't want to be, because that would put a bullet on your back, literally. So he came here to continue his seminary school, and he said he came here and he knew no English but he somehow was able to graduate from seminary school. And I remember asking him, how'd you do that? He's like, oh, I had a Spanish to English dictionary. And I would just like write my papers with that dictionary going back and forth. And I was like, wow, that's, that's incredible. I don't know if I would have been able to do that. Um, but he was able to become a pastor in Irving actually. So I've lived my whole life in, in Dallas County. Um, my parents traveled the United States separately and then they both met at a quinceanera in Dallas County and fell in love with Dallas because of the long summers and um, have just, they started their family here, their home, and, and we've never left. We love Dallas County, so really grateful for that. But what I learned from both of their stories really was the importance of education and the importance of like working hard, being a hard worker to help support, um, not just like yourself, but your family and your community. Because a lot of times as, a, as an immigrant or a daughter of immigrants, you, your, your money gets spread out thin, if that makes sense. So. I still help with my grandmother's expenses as well because to me it's unfair to ask my cousins who make like ten dollars a day to be equal contributors as me that makes a lot more than ten dollars a day so I, I think it, it instilled in me this sense of community and this sense of helping others which kind of led me into my current role um, in helping helping people who are coming into the United States and, and might have some sort of language barrier so that they're able to get access and resources because I remember how it was like when um, I would be the interpreter and translator for my family when they were first starting out here. But yeah, that's kind of in a nutshell um, some lessons that I learned from, from my parents' immigration story. I'm really grateful that they immigrated to Dallas County. So I really think it was the best um, decision for, for them and for me. I can pass it over. As a little girl and it's something that I've always kept really close to my heart. Um, but it definitely has been a struggle, especially when I was younger, you know, going to school and kind of comparing myself to other students and seeing that I had very strong family values and sometimes that wasn't the same for others, so. So, um, we were privy to the questions before coming here and this one was one of the ones that stood out to me um, because they're, they're because of identity, right? And, and this duality that I am fortunate to have. And so there's um, there's a phrase in Spanish that says, ni de aquí ni de acá, which loosely translates to not from here nor from there, right? And so um, one of the things that I've had to learn to go through is not being American enough in the United States and not being Mexican enough in Mexico, right? So. Um, just taking the good from both of those and not ignoring the bad, but just taking what you can and then just doing what's best for you, taking those family values, um, um, as was said earlier, and then just seeing that any obstacles that you had to go through, right? Anything that made it more challenging, just like you're saying, you know, comparing yourself to others in schools and maybe not having the same opportunities or the same resources, and then just knowing that you come from something that as Willis was saying, it's your fuel to do better. Yeah, that's interesting. You, you share that phrase, Elizabeth, uh, ni de aquí ni de allá. Um, that's something that I've also kind of, you know, wrestled with. And uh, I remember recently seeing, uh, I don't remember if it was like a t-shirt or something, but it, it said, uh, de aquí y de allá. So like reclaiming that you're from here and there, right? So just kind of a way to, uh, I guess, yeah, reclaim that like sense of like not really knowing what your place is. So. Um, 
Willis, what are some unique ways or unique challenges that you face as a first generation American? I think the challenge is, yeah, we, we talked about navigating the different cultures, you know, being American and then being Chinese as well. Um, you know, when I saw this question earlier, I wanted to you know, take it just a different direction in the sense that, because uh, my parents always encouraged me, and we talked about, you know, taking the good from you know, each of the cultures and incorporating that, maybe not ignoring the bad. And I think that's maybe one thing that my parents really ingrained in me. And she always said, you know, our, there's a lot of good that we hope that we've passed on, but there's also a lot of bad, right? And you've seen. So please, the things that you're learning in the new culture and as an American, the things that are good, incorporate those. Uh, and one thing, I'll give you an example. For the Chinese culture at the time, uh, it was very patriarchal. So part of it was, you know, when the, the man came home from work, you know, he kicked his shoes off, dinner would be prepared, and as soon as he finished, he would just sit back and say, okay, I'm, it's time for me to relax because I worked the whole day. And uh, grandma at the time, okay, well, I, let me clean up everything. Let me put the kids to bed. Let me... And, my mom, she said, you know, when growing up, she realized there was something wrong with that picture. And she didn't understand because the culture at the time was just, that was the way it was. But she's like, my grandma works just as hard as him. Maybe he's not, you know, doing it in this way. And so she said, I, when I came to America, I saw that that change, it was starting to look a little different. And so she was encouraging me, but also challenging me. So I remember as a child, one of the challenges was at sixth grade, I remember it was maybe 7.30, 8 o'clock. I would hear this bell. She would come up and she have a mop. And in my brother's room next door, she'd have a vacuum cleaner. And she's like, all right, it's time for you to help me clean the house. And we go, what do you mean clean the house? She's like, well, I'm not going to do it by myself. And your dad's not going to be the one doing it. You're going to help do it. And I think those are the things over the years teaching me how to clean, how to cook, you know, how to take care of kids, change diapers. And I think it's very, very thankful because I think learning, being now in the culture uh, in America to see there's more help, I think, that uh, men are providing women. I think that's really helped in my marriage, for example, because my wife is working too, and she's like, hey, can you help me cook dinner tonight? Can you help me, you know, go to the grocery store? And so being able to learn how to do those things. But if I came and not had that, maybe the opportunity to learn that, and I'd maybe stayed in just how the culture have done it, then... Uh, I, I could see maybe problems now. If I got married, I would not know how to do those things and not be of help, and that would be a source of conflict. So I think the challenge was growing up, having to learn how to break some of those things and maybe just being challenged to do things I didn't really want to do. And, uh, but thankful that those have really helped me learn and to grow. Yeah, it's interesting to, to hear about, I guess, that, that change in, in patriarchy, right? Like the um, kind of subservience that uh, was expected um, in, in a way. Uh, I kind of wonder too that like if, you know, some of that might be cultural, right, from other countries, but I also wonder uh, if that's kind of generational too, if part of it is generational. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess we would have to see how, how things are in some of those countries of origin, right? Like, do you know, are things any different in, in, in China, for instance, in, in that respect? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's slowly changing because I think as the workforce, you're starting to see uh, women go to work more. Uh, but it's still, you can see there's a, a battle. There's still a, a wrestling going forth. And I think maybe even here in this country, you'll still see that kind of back and forth, right? And so, uh, you know, I have two kids now, 10 and 8, and yep, same thing. They're now younger than me, but oh, they just last week learning how to clean the bathroom. And, you know, Dad, why do we have to do this? And trying to give them the whole... I had to do it like you, and trust me, you'll appreciate it. And, you know, they don't really understand yet. But, yeah, I think uh, to answer your question, I think it's changing a little. Uh, still room to grow. But thankfully, hopefully, if we continue teaching that, that, that will help the next generation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a nine-year-old son, and, uh, you know, so much where you said we're, we're teaching him how to, you know, do all these things. And my wife will always tells him, says, oh, you have to learn how to, you know, clean a bathroom so you, you know, you can do that in college. And he's like, well, I'm not going to college for another 10 years, so why are you teaching me now? Um, Adriana, how has being a first-generation individual influenced your educational and career choices? 
Yeah. Okay. Now I won't scream because I have a mic. Um, so as I kind of alluded to earlier, my mother was the only one out of six to go to high school. And my father really came to the U.S. because he was studying, um, which I think he was the youngest of 14. And a lot of his siblings also didn't study. So they really instilled in me the importance of going to school. Um, they didn't know exactly how that was going to happen. They're like, you'll, you'll figure it out with scholarships and grants when it's time. Um, so a lot of those um, like FAFSA forms and like university tours, I had to navigate on my own, but I was very fortunate because I had their full support. When I know when my mother was trying to go to school, she had no support from her, from her, her family. So that, that like reassurance to do it, um, especially because I was, I'm the first of a lot. So I was like the first United States citizen. I was the first to speak English in my whole family. I was the first to go to university. And I mean, this is like ancestral going back and back and back and back and back. So I felt a lot of like pressure to succeed and a lot of um, gratitude for the opportunities that the United States did provide me. And um, Career-wise, I um, speak Spanish, and so all of the jobs that I was in, I always would speak in Spanish with clients, with um, other coworkers. My first, one of my first jobs was cleaning houses in college, so that I could um, make money to go to to go to school. And I remember I was like the in the middle between the the woman of the house and then her other helpers as well so i would be able to like be in the middle interpreting for small things and providing clarification um, my first job after that um, my first official job was with avance dallas that's a nonprofit that provides parenting courses um, predominantly in spanish and everyone there talks spanish and it was such like a a breath of fresh air to be in a space where everyone spoke Spanish and understood like even like lunchtime. I remember once I had coworkers who were bringing out tostadas and tortas and aguacate and it was so cool to just be able to like do little kind of like potluck style um, with people who understood a little bit of like the Latinidad culture. Um, and when I came to the city, my job was with the Office of Arts and Culture. So I worked um, with funding programs, so providing opportunities for artists and organizations to receive funds based off of arts and cultural services. And I started doing um, info sessions in Spanish and translating the application into Spanish because we were looking at the data and we weren't serving a lot of Spanish speaking residents, even though they make up 42% of the population. There wasn't like a clear, I think we were serving like 10% with our like initial surveys. And, and my first thought was because there's not things in Spanish. So people who speak Spanish aren't gonna wanna go to an arts and cultural experience in English. Like they're gonna be so lost, they're gonna be so bored. So we should try to recruit artists who speak Spanish to have workshops in Spanish. That'll make people feel more comfortable going. And so it worked. We were able to get our numbers up, um, which is great, especially because in the city of Dallas, 42% of residents speak languages other than English, um, with around 37 of that being Spanish speakers. So when you look at scale, that's around 450,000 Dallas residents. Um, so it's really, really important that we're trying to serve all of the needs of our residents. Um, and in fact, I wanted to do a little plug that the city of Dallas worked with the American Immigration Council to create the economic brief um, kind of brief that shows the impact of immigrants in the city of Dallas. Uh, I think a really, really interesting statistic is that in the city of Dallas, immigrants earned 10.7 billion, so with a B, billion dollars in 2022. After paying taxes, that gave them $8.2 billion of spending power. And when you look at the overall economy of the city of Dallas, that's 20% of spending power, which is a lot, a lot of economic um, benefit that the city receives from our immigrants. So um, as a daughter of immigrants that works for the city of Dallas, I'm always trying to have that kind of lens in mind and share my lived experience so that we're really not overlooking them, but trying our best to serve the needs of our residents. And um, in that brief, you can, if you're interested in reading, it has a lot of really cool statistics. Um, it's on the Welcoming Communities Immigrant Affairs website, and I'm happy to, to share the link if you wanted to learn more about the city. Anyone else wants, if I should pass the mic to anyone else? Or? Awkward silence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Marjana, uh, what are uh, some achievements that you're most proud of since moving to the US? I'm, um, <clears throat> first of all, I'm proud that 
I live in the city that is welcoming city. I'm so proud that I was actually part of this recertification and that Dallas is one of um, welcoming city. I'm proud of my um, family and uh, resilience that we were able to adapt and start not only here in Germany, first in Germany, you starting from scratch, then in the United States. Uh, my husband, who was my rock and still my rock, when I was um, um, during the first two months when I just wanted to go home, um, he was my rock and he always reminded me why we're here in the first place. Uh, I'm proud of my son, like I said, who um, was raised in living in two cultures and became a perfect mix of these two cultures. He is, he is really um, <clears throat> a perfect mix and I'm very proud of the young man he became and um, who stand up for, for injustice for everyone always. Uh, I'm super proud of my work because I am able through my work to help people who need it the most, uh, survivors of human rights abuses, including refugees, family violence, and human trafficking. Uh, I'm with the agency that actually become my second family and it helps me a lot in the United States in general to be surrounded by people, very diverse group of people, amazing people who um, has the right heart to do this job, be uh, helping um, underserved populations and uh, we have actually staff who knows and understand their culture, who speak their language, who look and talk like them, which make everything much easier when you come to the United States. When someone who speak your language and understand your cultural, religious barriers, all barriers you have, um, understand what you what you can or cannot do. So um, I think this is the most, um, this is the things I'm proud about. Thank you. Thank you. And Adriana, so yeah, that link that you mentioned, we'll go ahead and post it on the YouTube. So we'll, do, we'll put that on the, uh, so if you can share that with me. Okay, yeah, I'll share it with you. Thank you. And um, Jessica, so. Um, what challenges did you face in school or the workplace due to your first generation status and how did you overcome them? So when I was in school, in college, right after high school, I decided that I wanted to move uh, away from my family. I wanted to, you know, have that typical college experience and to really, you know, fit in, join clubs, do all those things. But I realized, you know, I wasn't ready for that really quickly on. Um, I felt really homesick. You know, I don't think I fully maybe accepted even my values, my strong family values. And I had to move, you know, back home. And for a long time, I did feel like a failure. I felt like, you know, I had failed. I had failed my parents, myself. So I really had to accept, you know, who I was and I accept my identity, uh, both of them. And it, you know, landed me at UTA. I still completed my bachelor's, my master's, and I'm just, I'm grateful for the opportunity because it really helped me learn more about myself and what I wanted to do and who I was. Thank you for sharing. Uh, anybody else wanna chime in on that question? Elizabeth, what achievements are you most proud of as a first-generation American? Um, for me, it's just being able to be in the position that I am today. Um, I am, like Adriana, the first U.S.-born citizen. I was the first in my family to go to college. Um, and now I work in a male-dominated field. So to me, all of that... Um, it wouldn't have been possible. I wouldn't have had the drive that I that I grew up with if it weren't for knowing that my parents sacrificed a lot when they left Mexico. And they also did it for good purpose, right? To provide better opportunities for their families back home. And so that was always my drive to do um, better than them because that was kind of like the message that they always had. Like, we know you're capable. Um, we wish we would have been able to do more in our home country, but we didn't have the opportunities. We came here to kind of afford 
they met here, right? But kind of afford whatever family they would have in the future, better opportunities. So that, that was always a motivating factor for me to do the best that I could and try to take opportunity, um, take advantage of all the opportunities that came my way. Now, it wasn't without challenge, right? Because being the firstborn here, um, I didn't know, like Adriana, how to apply for FAFSA, how to apply to colleges, all of that was new. I didn't have anyone close to me to help me. And so um, it, just being able to be proud of myself for doing that. And then most importantly, that I have navigated that, that I've been able to help other people in my community and close to me, be able to go through those experiences with a lot more ease. That's what really like makes me feel accomplished. That's that's my biggest thing. That I know that people very close to me, other first generation kids, and you know, in, in my family, in, in in my family friends, that I'm able to give them that extra step that would have made a world of a difference for me. Um, because I do feel like if I would have had just a little bit more resources or just a little bit more guidance, maybe I'd be doing better. I feel very proud of the position that I'm in. But like it would have helped, right? Um, you see it all the time when people that come from generational wealth or just, you know, um, multi-generational living here in the United States, it's a different experience. So um, I'm most proud of the position that I am now that I'm able to give back to my family and that um, I'm able to be a good example for my children and kind of set my my ceiling is their floor. And I think that's the mo like the best thing that, that I could be most proud of. take it because I want to brag about myself a little bit if that's okay on my achievements because um, it was hard it was hard being first generation and doing everything for the first so one of the achievements that I'm the most proud of is that I graduated college I went to UTD and I graduated debt-free and then I graduated from my master's debt-free because um, I was very very afraid of getting debt I remember that's all my parents would say and I think it's very cultural too to not have any debt so they were like, you can go to school, but you have to figure out how you're going to pay for it. So um, the way that I figured out to pay for it is I w would clean houses. I was a nanny. I also was a birthday princess. So I would go around and do birthday parties for kids. I mean, scavenger hunts, story time, face painting, costumes um, on the weekends to make funds. And I was able to save those, those dollars. Um, I also lived with my parents, so that helped a lot. I'm so grateful for their support and that they have this culture of like, no, you stay in the home until you're ready to leave. It wasn't like, oh, get out, you're 18. It really was like, no, you can stay here until it's, until it's your time. Um, so I was able to save up money. And when I graduated, it felt really nice to um, graduate debt-free. And um, my master's also was debt-free, which was amazing. And because of that, I feel like I had a really strong privilege when I entered my young adulthood um, and being able to qualify for homes um, because I, I did have this clean slate because I was able to, to work so hard when I was in college and getting my master's degree. Um, and it, again, it was just very difficult because I had like no one in my circle to, to ask for help. But since I've gone through it, I feel like now I can help some of the people who are coming behind me. So like my cousins that are coming in and are trying to navigate it, I, I try to help them out. And then even just like, like random, like friends of friends, right? Like my mom will be like, oh, I have a friend who has a daughter who's trying to go to school. Can you help her? And so being able to like help others feels really, really nice. And I, I, I'm happy that I, I feel like I'm the person that young me would have wanted and would have needed. Um, and to me, that's something that I, I feel very proud of, um, especially as a, as a first gen American. But yeah, I wanted to share that because I don't ever get to share that story. <laughs> yeah, I think, <clears throat> so like I mentioned, I, I myself am an immigrant, but uh, I guess one thing that I have in common with you know several of you that are first generation is that we had immigrant parents as well that needed a, a lot of help figuring things out. Like I remember as a kid, like, you know, talking to whatever company to try to figure out why the bill is this much or, you know, and kind of going back and forth and just kind of having to grow up a little bit faster because of that, right? Especially like I'm, I'm the oldest child for my, for my mom, so, you know, uh, that really resonated with me. So, um, so yeah, we wanted to share some information about like our own workforce and like even the panel here today, we have uh, we have a couple that are, uh, you know, community members or not necessarily just community members, but um, that work with community organizations, uh, you know, the city uh, with uh, refugee services and uh, with uh, healthcare, right? Um, 
and then we have a couple that are county employees. We don't have exact you know figures as to you know who are our, our employee uh, who are immigrants, but we know we have uh, you know employees that are from uh, diff you know different countries, and many of them are also like first generation as well. Um, but yeah, I was told by our HR department we don't keep that data, so uh, we don't have exact figures, but um, but we know uh, we have them, so uh, we're definitely very proud of that and. Very proud of all of you and, and very thankful. We're very lucky to have you as, as community members. Uh, you are uh, wonderful um, individuals, so, so thank you for sharing your stories today. Uh, wanted to kind of open it up, if anybody from, from uh, the audience would like to share their, uh, their story <coughs> in any way uh, or anything about, or if anything that you heard here today resonated or if you have any questions. Okay, um, let me grab a mic. Hi, my name is April Rodriguez Hani, and I'm a Mexican African American Muslim. So, all the diversity is on <laughs> is on this. Uh, I was born in U.S., but my father was Mexican. My mom was half Mexican African American. So I'm coming from. But also, I grew up in Mexico. My siblings, which is was full Mexicans, they used to call me wet back. Go back to your country, like U.S. You know, so, and they always tell me, you are ni de aquí, ni de allá. Where are you gonna vote? In the middle of the border? Or jokes like that, that you're like, but I am Mexican. I live in Mexico. Yes, but you was born in US. So then one time, and this is a funny story, I have one of my Mexican Americans, Muslim friends coming to Mexico, to Monterrey. <coughs> she was bringing her husband from Egypt and the husband ended up being detained by migration in the capital of Mexico, in Distrito Federal, now Ciudad de Mexico. We had to go, my brother is a lawyer, and we had to travel to Monterrey. We was in Reynosa, Tamaulipas. So we had traveled to the airport. Me, being a Mexican, I have my dual nationality. I have all my IDs as an American, all my IDs, and even uh, birth certificate as a Mexican, so I have the double nationality. We're in the immigration affairs in the airport, and the first thing that they ask, we're so prompt to go and where is the husband and all the information, so we're like, okay, so the guy in immigration, Mexican immigration is like, okay guys, so are you Americans? Where is your permit that you have to travel, that you cross the line, I think 50 kilometers from the border that you have to enter to the country. Of course, as a good Mexican, I'm not gonna leave my American, my Mexican-American friend go down by herself, right? And I was like, my brother was like, April, just don't talk because you're asking for the permit. And you guys just travel with me. I snuggle you into the country and I'm gonna end up in jail and you're gonna be deported to US. I was laughing, of course, after because we just didn't say nothing. My, my brother managed to say, oh yeah, they have their IDs. Uh, I'm, I'm the representative from that. Being a good lawyer, he, he was like, okay, I will defend you, right? But also I'm gonna go to jail if they discover that I'm being smuggling Americans to Mexico. <laughs> but I, I was like, well, I have my identification as a Mexican, but I'm not gonna let her go down by herself. So of course I'm gonna say I'm with her, right? So. Things like that, that you experience having a double nationality, two identities, three identities, because also when I go to my husband country, everybody talks to me in Arabic, and they think that I'm so mean that I don't wanna talk to them in their language. And then I have to end up showing my passport, and when they see the Rodriguez right there, they're like, um, and I ended up apologizing. Oh, yeah, my husband ended up apologizing. Ah, oh, Mexican. And I, like, oh, thank God. Yes, the Mexican always saved me, you know. And also, when when I when I go around, I I cover. So people attempt or put you on tags that oh, because you're cover, you are Middle East or or somewhere in Asia. So they speak Spanish, and when then I reply back in Spanish in full Spanish, they're like. What, what just happened? And then not just with the Spanish, with the slang, the Mexican slang. So they're like, 
they didn't understood. So I worked for a couple of uh, years at El Rancho as a customer service. And people was afraid to come to the front and complain with the customers because the first thing, they will come and take a picture. Second thing, they won't really know that I speak Spanish. So they're like, yeah, there's a padre. She speaks Spanish. And I'm like, yes, I speak Spanish. So it is a lot of sometimes uh, things going on. Also, hatred towards to you and you receive sometimes racism and, and you're all the time is struggling to find your own identity and, and fitting in the society because it is difficult to be different, super difficult. And I'm super proud of all of you. Thank you so much for sharing. If I admire you girls now, is is beyond because you're sharing all the struggles and, and being so honest about what's going on with your cultural style and your families and everything else. And I feel so much sympathy for you guys and I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much for sharing these stories. Hi, my name is Belinda. I work with um, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. I was just curious, I was, born and raised in Nebraska, of all places, which is, I think to this day, probably 98% white. And I didn't, people have asked me if I had uh, experienced discrimination, but I don't think they knew what to do with me because I was one of the few, our family was. And so um, the, the bad thing was that uh, we weren't allowed to speak Spanish in school. But we weren't the only ones. There were German immigrants and a lot of people from Poland. And nobody was allowed to speak their native language. So, you know, I, I lost it. I cannot speak Spanish. But I was wondering if any of you uh, experienced any kind of discrimination in, in school. And I'll keep it brief. But yes, um, I, my identity being not Mexican in an area that is very Mexican, I would sometimes get like, people would get weirded out when I would say that I'm from El Salvador in Costa Rica, but born here. Um, because people would always assume that I was Mexican. And so um, I remember a lot of my like school counterparts were, were Mexican and I couldn't relate to a lot of the cultural part. I mean, we speak Spanish and some of the music, yes, but when it comes to like very specific food or dialects or slang, I wouldn't know. Um, so I, I, would, I would get made fun of sometimes and they're like, oh, se Centro Americana, like you're, like you're not like, uh, like us that are Mexican. And I would get similar kind of comments from, from the white children that'd be like, go back to Mexico. And I'm like, but I can't, I've never been there. And I have no familial ties there. So if you send me there, I'll be very lost. Um, but I, I feel like it helped me with my resilience. And I also remember when I was in school, I would always sit next to the newcomers because there were a lot of newcomers that were coming into my school and I would help them like translate and interpret. Because I remember I had one that was in US history and she's like, I literally just got here like last month. I know nothing about US history. So I would sit with her and help her like learn who George Washington is and learn all these other lessons because she had such a, a large disadvantage because she had just came from El Salvador. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, I, I, I did feel it sometimes. And then I, I'm also, I also f sometimes felt it because of the color of my skin, because I'm a little bit more, a little bit more melanated. Um, and there is like some, some colorism that, that is very apparent, I think in most cultures, but um, in, in the Latino culture it is. So I remember being like, oh, you don't go outside because you're gonna get too brown, because I do tan very easily. So having to navigate those cultural kind of stereotypes as well. Um, I think really like shaped me when I was a child. And I'll pass it to someone else now. So um, I kind of have like a two part answer to that. Um, growing up, I like I mentioned, I grew up in Oak Cliff in a very Latinx dominated um, neighborhood. So I didn't necessarily experience too much racism, thank God. But whenever I did get to high school till this day, and that was several years ago, 
I remember that someone told me I always received very, you know, high grades, top of the class and stuff. And so someone once um, in, I think it was like health, health ed maybe, um, I got the top score in the class and they were like, why are you getting the top score in the class? Shouldn't you be pregnant by now? And I was like, okay, that's why I'm going to graduate at the top of the class, and you are not. So um, kind of like what I said earlier, I took that, even though it was negative, I took it as motivation to prove them wrong, right, to beat the stereotypes, to beat the statistics, um, and then just it, it was my fuel. And so um, there were some things, but I kind of I didn't ignore them. I just kind of said, because you don't believe in me, because you want me to fail, I'm not going to. And so I kind of tried to instill that into my children. Now, we live in a predominantly white um, city, and it's very conservative. And so um, I teach them to not take th that type of you know comments from anyone. Um, I teach them to be proud of who they are. And they, they do hear things here and there. And so I just I, I want them to more importantly, because that, that was something that I wish I would have done when I was younger to stand up more for my, like, for my family, for the people that come from different countries and things like that, because we're fortunate. I think we're more fortunate to be able to live in this duality than people that just are born here and kind of just have one culture. Um, and so I, I teach them to stand up for themselves and stand up for everyone else because I try to pass on the message. I didn't have as many opportunities as you do, and you don't. You never know. We do have in our community, um, you know, immigrants and first other first generations. My kids are not first generation, but they all go to school with other kids, and so just to kind of stand up for anybody that goes through, you know, that that may face any racism, and colorism is very real. I I, I am definitely on the browner side, and my daughter is um, a little more brown than my son is and I and I teach her to celebrate that she is just you know very beautiful and it doesn't matter what color she is um, because that is very very predominant in Latinx communities I think thank you all so much for sharing and uh, one more question or comment comment um, uh, my name is Gabby uh, uh, I'm I was born in Eritrea in Africa East Africa um, grew up here but I was born there. Uh, but last year we had a, um, a resource fair for our community. And I just wanted to give a shout out to the city of Dallas because uh, at that resource fair, uh, they were the only table that had flyers in both uh, English and Tigrinya, which is the native language there. And everybody felt very comfortable. So I guess I just wanted to kind of highlight the importance of uh, communication, you know, being able to read and understand what's being provided to them. Uh, because even though we had a lot of resources, that was the one table that they were able to completely understand. So I just wanted to give you guys a shout out. Um, thank you so much for doing that. That was, that was awesome. Yeah, that goes to Yolanda, that's right here. She, she, she does really, really well with our community events and making sure that we're aligned with all of the resources. So yeah. yes. Thank you so much, Yolanda. <laughs> Right on that note, well, thank you uh, again for uh, for our panelists, and thank you all for coming for joining us here here today. Thank you.